Yes, thank you very much for the introduction and welcome to our webinar Basics of Taxation, also on behalf of Metro. This is the first of two webinars that are offered by Metro to learn more about saturation technology. After a short introduction into the basic saturations, the second webinar will focus on troubleshooting in saturation. Why is saturation still widely used in nearly all labs? First of all, in comparison to chromatographic or spectroscopic methods, saturation is an absolute method means a titration delivers a quantitative result without requiring any instrument or application-specific calibration. And it is a rather simple method. Usually there is not much sample preparation required. The sample has to be weighed or measured volumetrically and some solvent has to be added. But that's it for most of the applications. It is also a very universal method. A titrator can be equipped for the determination of various species from inorganic ions to complex molecules. Reproducibility is usually below 1%, but in many applications even less than 0.3% are to achieve. The performance of the titration system can even be enhanced when automation for liquid handling or sample preparation steps are used. As already said, titration is an absolute method. Titration means counting of ions or molecules. So what are the chemical requirements for a successful titration? First of all, every titration is based on a quantitative chemical reaction of the sample, the analyte, and the reagent solution, the titrant. The stoichiometry of this chemical reaction must be known to calculate the amount of analyte in the sample. Therefore, the sample must be fully dissolved in a suitable solvent and a suitable indication method must be available to follow the course of the chemical reaction. The most common titration methods are acid-based titration, either in an aqueous solution or an inorganic solvent, Complexometry, which can be used for determination of metal ions, like the determination of calcium magnesium hardness using EDTA as titrant. Another important titration method is precipitation titration. For example, the determination of chloride using silver nitrate solution. Also important are redox titrations, means the chemical reaction is not a neutralization, complexation or precipitation, but the reduction or oxidation of the analyte. Typical examples here are the stereometry, the manganometry, or iodometry. Besides the nature of the chemical reaction, we also differentiate the different titration principles. The most common one is definitely the direct titration. A known amount of sample, either a weight or a volume, is added to a titration vessel and then titrated with the titrant solution of known concentration. The analyte then directly reacts with the titrant at, and at the equivalence point, all sample ions or molecules have reacted with the titrant. At the end of the titration then, there is either an excess of the titrant or the full consumption of the analyte, which is then indicated by a suitable indication method. However, not for every analyte a direct titration method can be used, for example, if no suitable sensor is available. In this case, a so-called indirect titration method is used. For an indirect titration, a known amount of reagent solution is added to the sample solution, and this reagent solution then reacts with the analyte, and a new species is formed. And by titrating this new species now, we then can calculate the original amount of the analyte in the sample. One example for this is the titration of bivalent copper ions. A known amount of potassium iodide is added to the sample solution, which enforces the reduction of the bivalent copper. Therefore, iodine is generated. This iodine is then titrated in a redox titration using thiosulfate solution. Another indirect titration method 
is the so-called back titration. In a back titration, the analyte solution is treated with an excess of reagent solution, and the excess of the reagent is then titrated directly. A typical application is the determination of metal ions like aluminium, since no suitable sensor for aluminium is available. The aluminium solution is treated with an excess of EDTA, and then the remaining EDTA is titrated with a copper solution using a copper sensitive electrode for the indication of the equivalence point. Whatever titration method is used, the result means the content of the analyte in the sample has to be calculated afterwards. And therefore, a few variables are required. First of all, we need to know the exact sample size, and this is usually a weight or a measured volume. For liquid samples, maybe also a dilution factor has to be considered. Since titration means counting, we also need to know the exact concentration of the titrant solution. The concentration can be expressed in various units. Very popular ones are moles per liter, parts per million ppm, or grams per liter. Since the titrant concentration may differ from the nominal concentration, this has to be corrected with a factor, the so-called titer. And of course, we need to know the volume of the titrant solution that was consumed up to the equivalence point. This value is provided by reading either the level at the volumetric turret or is directly delivered by the titration instrument. Finally, to calculate the exact analyte concentration, we also need to know the stoichiometry of the chemical reaction. And this is then considered in a factor. This factor is one for titrations of a monocrotic acid with a monocrotic base, but can also be different, especially for redox titrations. For example, if permanganate is used for the titration of a bivalent iron, then the factor is five. But please let me get back to the titer again. What is it and how can it be determined? Usually a titrant solution is made by weighing a chemical substance into a volumetric flask and then filling it up with solvent. In this case, the real concentration has to be determined afterwards by titration using a primary standard. But the main reason why a titer determination is required is that the concentration is not always stable. If a titrant solution is not used up within short time, some solutions like alkaline titrants or redox titration may face a concentration change. For alkaline titrants, this is due to the uptake of carbon dioxide. Others may face oxidation or reduction by light. In both cases, the real concentration of the titrant is decreasing, and we call this the aging of the titrant. The titer factor is then calculated from the real determined concentration divided by the nominal concentration. And again, we recommend to monitor the titer frequently, depending on the stability of the titrant. The aging of the titrant can also be reduced by using certain countermeasures, like absorber tubes, brown glass bottles for light-sensitive solutions, or storage at cool temperatures. When now all required variables are available, we can calculate the result. The concentration of the analyte is the product of volume at the equivalence point times the titrant concentration times the titer value and the stoichiometric factor, and all divided by the sample size. Of course, independence of in what unit the result has to be expressed, the formula may differ. The advantage of modern titration instruments is that the calculation of the final result is directly done after the titration is finished. However, the best calculation formula is useless if the indication of the end or equivalence point is not correct. More than 200 years ago, titration was invented using color indicators. Titrant was added until a significant color change was observed in the sample solution. 
Still very popular is phenolphthalein as color indicator for acid-base saturations, which changes its color exactly at pH 8.2. Let me explain its use with saturation of the acetic acid. As long as the pH value is lower than 8.2, the solution is colorless. Then there is a sudden jump of the pH value caused by the addition of sodium hydroxide, and then the solution turns violet. pH 8.2 marks exactly the middle of this jump, and therefore phenolphthalein is perfectly suited for this application. The same may also apply for the titration of hydrochloric acid. Even though the center of this pH jump is at pH 7, this makes no significant difference since the pH jump is very steep. Problems only arise when a mixture of both acids is titrated. There is already a first pH jump that indicates the hydrochloric acid, but since the pH value is still below 8.2, it is not recognized when using phenolphthalein. The visible color change then indicates the total amount of acid, a specification of hydrochloric acid and acetic acid in this case is not possible. This means other color indicators with a color change at lower pH values should be used for this, but usually these only show a color change and no direct switch from colorless to color. A typical color indicator is methyl red. It changes from a red color to a yellow. The use of such color indicators is still quite common, especially for manual, manual titrations. The only problem is that the human eye may not be able to exactly determine the same color in every titration. In addition, once the titration is finished, there is no chance to re-evaluate the titration since it is not traceable at all. Therefore, the better option for such applications is to use a photometric sensor like the optrode. Various wavelengths are available in one sensor to cover all kinds of color indicators. The big advantage of such sensors is that the color change is converted into an electrical signal that can be recorded and evaluated by the titrator. This is definitely much more reproducible, reliable, and especially more traceable than any manual titration. The only limitation would be precipitation during titration, which is reducing the measuring signal. Therefore, photometric indication is nowadays replaced with photometric indication methods whenever possible. In the classical potentiometry, ion selective electrodes are used the most common example is definitely the pH electrode for acid-base titrations. The advantage of an ion selective electrode is that the sensor signal is very specific for the individual analyte, but this also means that the analysis of different species requires different sensors. Other common potentiometric methods are precipitation titrations, redox titrations, or complexometry. Another alternative indication method is conductometry. During precipitation, the conductivity in the sample solution is changing and the endpoint is indicated by a sharp bend in the titration curve as the titrant is no longer precipitated and therefore the conductivity of the sample solution is increasing. However, all potentiometric methods and also the conductivity method suffer from being either suitable for only one specific species or require dedicated sensor maintenance since the sensor chemically interacts with the sample solution. If this wants to be avoided, then thermometric titration might be an option. Thermometric titration is using the temperature change that occurs during titration caused by the reaction enthalpy of the chemical reaction between analyte and titrant. This, for example, works very well for acid-base titrations in non-aqueous solutions where standard pH electrodes may fail, either due to poor electrostatical conditions or sensor contamination. Whatever potentiometric indication method is used, the choice of the sensor is the most important decision to be made. The sensor selection depends on the sample matrix 
the available volume of the sample solution or any possible chemical interference. Also, electrostatic effects have to be considered, for example, when non aqueous solvents are used. In this case, the sensor should have an internal electrical shielding to avoid any influence from the lab environment. Also, the signal change during titration should be sufficient to enable a clear and reproducible endpoint evaluation. As a rule of thumb, the potential jump should be at least 70 millivolts. Very important is also the response time of the sensor, means the sensor has to be fast enough to follow the course of the titration without any delay. And last but not least, the sensor has to be very rugged, means resistant to the chemicals and robust enough for manual handling like cleaning and electrode preparation. As you may have already experienced yourself, there is a wide variety of electrodes available. Therefore, we recommend to have a look into the manufacturer's literature on electrode selection. Only little information about the sample matrix, temperature and measuring range, and maybe possible contamination is necessary to guide you to find the best electrode for your application. Once the decision on the indication method is made, all the other required equipment has to be selected. Depending on the expected volume at the end or equivalence point, the work burret volume should be chosen. As a rule of thumb, the end or equivalence point should be within 10 to 90% of the nominal burret volume to achieve maximum precision. The burret volume should be definitely large enough to avoid refilling of the burret during titration. And also important, steering is crucial Usually, either a magnetic or rod stirrer is used. Magnetic stirrers offer more flexibility when different beaker sizes or titrant volumes are used on the same instrument. Rod stirrers are used whenever strong steering is required or when the use of magnetic steering bars wants to be avoided. However, the choice of the bullet, the sensor, and the stirrer itself is not sufficient to guarantee a successful titration. Especially the arrangement of the stirrer, the sensor, and the burr tip are important. The importance of the electrode setup is very often underestimated. Therefore, we clearly recommend to document this in an application document, either by a detailed description or by a picture or a technical drawing. So, what had to be considered in the electrode setup? The burr tip should not deliver the titrant directly to the sensor. The sensor may indicate a too high titrant concentration since the titrant is not yet fully distributed in the beaker or has not reacted with the analyte. Much better is to place the burr behind the sensor, means the titrant is well distributed and has enough time to react with the analyte. In general, steering should be as fast as possible. However, a vortex should be avoided since the sensor might then not be fully immersed in the sample solution anymore or the sample solution may be spilled. Beaker and stirrer size should also be fixed and not changed, otherwise the steering efficiency may vary. The effect of the steering can be shown with a practical example. The sample here is deionized water but this may apply for other ion deficient samples as well. Once the stereo is switched off, a fixed sleeve type electrode provides a stable signal, whereas the significant signal drop for an electrode with ceramic pin diaphragm can be observed. This is why we strongly recommend to always work with the same steering speed and also recommend the use of fixed sleeve type electrodes for pH titrations to a fixed endpoint. What else has to be considered for the electrode setup? First of all, don't forget to open the refilling plug for the reference electrolyte. Otherwise, the sample may block the diaphragm and the reference potential may become unstable. A fixed electrode holder should be used to assure equal positioning of the sensor and the titration vessel. In addition, it also helps to avoid mechanical damage to the electrode by hitting the titration vessel. Also ensure that the sensor is filled with enough reference electrolyte. 
Once the saturation is finished, don't forget to rinse the sensor. But please, do not wipe off remaining rinsing solution from the sensor. Even though many users fear a carryover to the next sample, this can usually be neglected and the risk of electrostatically charging or damaging the sensor is much higher. So, the hardware is ready, but so far we have not discussed the different saturation modes that are available. The first mode I want to talk about is the saturation to a defined measuring value, a fixed or set endpoint saturation. In the metron jargon, we call this the SET or set mode. In a set saturation, the stop criteria is a defined endpoint, either a millivolt value or a pH value. And in principle, this is nothing else than the potential metric version of a manual saturation using a color indicator. One of the most popular set saturations is the determination of the alkalinity of water sample with hydrochloric acid to the endpoint of pH 4.3, which equals the color change of the indicator methyl orange. The most important control parameters are the minimum and maximum saturation rate and the control range, the so-called dynamics. These parameters are easily explained with a practical example. The blue measuring points represent the pH value of the each addition, and the red line accounts for a corresponding total added volume. The saturation started at approximately pH 7.7 .7 with a target of 4.3, and the dynamics of two was chosen. This means that saturation is started with the maximum saturation rate in milliliters per minute, and once the pH value is lower than 6.3, which is the target value of pH 4.3 plus the dynamics of two, the saturator slows down and continues with the minimum saturation rate. In principle, the larger the dynamic range and the lower the maximum and especially the minimum rate is, the more precise is the saturation, but then also the saturation duration can take very long. Choosing a smaller value for the dynamics and the larger value for the minimum and maximum saturation rate speeds up the saturation, but this may then also compromise the precision, means the saturation is too fast and the endpoint is beyond the target value. Of course, needless to say that the sensor for a set saturation needs to be very fast. Since set saturations can be very sensitive and require quite some adjustments, nowadays so-called equivalent point saturations are much more common. For such, the saturation is done beyond the real endpoint, means beyond the accumularity of analyte and titrant, and then evaluated afterwards. In principle, we differentiate between two different types of the equivalent point saturations. The first is the monotonic equivalent point saturation, the MET mode. Here, the titrant addition is done in equal volume increments, typically around 100 microliters per addition. This allows a perfect manual control of the saturation speed, but can be of help for saturations in, in, in inhomogeneous sample solutions or whenever the kinetics are very slow. One major disadvantage of a monotonic saturation mode is the resulting long duration, especially for large stop volumes. Therefore, the much more common saturation mode is the dynamic equivalence point saturation, the DET or DET mode. Depending on the program parameters, the saturator can calculate the next volume increment depending on the signal change. This means whenever the signal is not changing significantly, larger titrant volumes are added. Whenever there is a steep change, then the volumes become smaller. Let me explain this difference between the monotonic and dynamic mode in a practical example. The sample is citric acid with two different sample sizes. The blue titration curve is the monotonic titration. Independent of the signal change, always 0.1 milliliters of titrants were added right from the beginning. This is then also done in the area of the potential chunk with the consequence that the number of measuring points is very small. This may result in a less precise or less reproducible evaluation of the titration, 
The red cross is a dynamic saturation. As long as there is no significant signal change, the saturation is done with a larger, rather large volume increment. As soon as the area of the potential jump is reached, the saturation is continued with much smaller increments, resulting in much more measuring points at the potential jump, and this allowing a more precise and reproducible evaluation. You can also see that once the potential jump is passed, the volume increments get larger again. So overall, a dynamic titration mode can be much faster and much more precise than a monotonic titration. The next question is on how to evaluate such an equivalence point. In the past, the titration curve was drawn on paper and then graphical methods were used. Modern titration instruments are using a mathematical evaluation method by calculating the first derivative of the titration curve. The steepest point in a titration curve represents the equivalence point, means this is indicated by a maximum or minimum of the first derivative depending on the signal change. By choosing a defined limit value for the first derivative, the endpoint recognition criteria, or otherwise called the ERC, the user can decide which peak should be considered as equivalence point or not. For titrations with more than one endpoint, this is also no problem, and this evaluation method is definitely much better and more precise and reproducible than doing it manually. In general, best results are obtained the more measuring points are available at the potential jump, and, of course, the steeper it is. Again, let me explain this in more detail by choosing two practical examples. The first sample is triprotic phosphoric acid, and an ERC of 5 was chosen, which is the default value of maximum instruments. For the first two protons, you can see a nice separation, whereas the third cannot be titrated anymore since its DKA value is too large. If an ERC of 5 is selected, then both equivalence points are evaluated and displayed. If such a titration is used for determining the phosphoric acid concentration, then in principle the titration could already be stopped once the first equivalence point is detected. However, in case of any further acidic impurities, one could also continue after the second equivalence point because then only if the volume of the first equivalent point equals the difference between the second and the first, then it is a pure phosphoric acid. The second example is citric acid again. Citric acid is also a triprotic acid, but because the pKa values are very close together, a proper separation of the equivalent point is not possible. Especially the second equivalence point is hardly to detect. You can see a very small maximum in the first derivative for the first and second protein. However, since these peaks are not very sharp, the precision might not be very good. To evaluate only the steep third equivalence point, therefore, is necessary. This can be done by either increasing the ERC criteria to a higher value to simply ignore the first two possible equivalence points. For titrations where you cannot specify a limit value for the ERC, it is recommended to use a low value for the ERC or choose the acceptance criteria greatest. In this case, all possible equivalence points are detected, but only the steepest potential jump in the titration curve will finally be evaluated. Besides the endpoint recognition, the user also wants to control the titration itself, especially its duration and precision. The most important parameters to control the titration are the following. First, the waiting time or pause before the first addition is done. Second, the signature criteria as an important parameter to decide when the next addition is done. Third, the minimum and maximum waiting time between the additions of the next volume increment. Fourth, the minimum and maximum volume increment for each single addition. And last but not least, 
the measuring point, there is a density. But why do we need these parameters? And what is the effect if they are modified? Let me start with the waiting time or pause before the start of the saturation. Such a pause is usually recommended whenever the sample solution is not ready for titration immediately. This could be the case if the sample size is not still homogeneously distributed in the solvent or if the electrode needs to accommodate to the sample solution and would provide an instable signal immediately after immersion in the sample solution. Sometimes also some time for a complete dissolution of the sample is required. Or the quantitative chemical reaction in an indirect titration has not been finished yet. In short, the waiting time or pause before titration starts should always be used whenever an instable electrode signal right at the titration start is expected, whatever the cause is. If it is not applied, then any random peak at the beginning of the titration may be recognized as equivalence point resulting in a too early stop of the saturation. The next parameter is the signal drift criteria. If you have a look at the regular saturation curve, you only see the measured points for the measured potential after each volume addition. If you would look at a continuously measured signal, then this is different. Each addition is followed by a sharp change of the measuring signal but then there is a certain equilibration time in which the signal is drifting back. The signal drift criteria defines at which potential drift the next addition is to be done. The value of the signal drift criteria has to be chosen based on the overall conditions in the titration vessel. Means, how fast is the titrant added? Are there any mixing effects between the titrant and the sample solution? How fast is the reaction between titrant and analyte? And, of special importance is, what is the response time of the sensor? You can imagine the larger the signal drift criteria is, the faster is the titration. But also, the lower it is, the slower is the titration. As a rule of thumb, you can estimate that reducing the signal drift criteria by half increases the titration time by a factor four. Metal instruments have a default value of 50 millivolts per minute for the signal drift criteria. For the majority of the titrations with a fast reaction between titrant and analyte and the fast sensor, this is perfectly suited. In principle, you could even use larger values, but then you have to check whether the analytical precision is compromised. This graph shows the titration of calcium and magnesium in drinking water using a signal drift criteria up to 500 millivolts per minute. You see that up to 50 moles per minute, there is a major impact on the titration duration and the precision is not affected. At higher values, the titration is not getting significantly faster anymore, but you can see the results start getting less precise. The next important parameter is the minimum and maximum waiting time, and this has to be seen in very close relationship with the signal drift criteria. The minimum and maximum waiting time are in principle tools to overrule the signal drift criteria in special situations. A minimum waiting time can help in case of a slow reaction kinetics or a slow response time of the sensor. Usually one tries to titrate as fast as possible, so a rather large signal drift criteria is used. But in special situations, the sensor may need a few seconds more to read a proper value. If no minimum waiting time is configured, then this would not be considered. This is also the case for mixing effects, especially when the titrant and sample solution has different solvents. A few seconds waiting time can improve the saturation a lot. The maximum waiting time, the other parameter, is basically, basically used to enforce an addition of a volume increment in case the signal drift criteria is never reached. However, the signal drift criteria should decide on this, but maybe for a few additions within a titration, this, this might be okay.
important, therefore, is that whenever you reduce the signal risk criteria, please ensure that the maximum waiting time is increased accordingly. The filtration duration can also be reduced by choosing limit value for the volume increments. A larger minimum volume increment may help to avoid too many time-consuming volume additions. A larger maximum increment may help to go faster through filtrations when there is no significant signal change. However, there is also certain things to consider. If the minimum volume increment is too large, then the number of measuring points at the potential jump might be too low as for a monotonic titration. If the maximum increment is too large, then there is the risk that the titrator misses the equivalence point. This can happen during photometric titrations. Usually the signal is quite stable until the end point is reached, especially when a color indicator with a rather sharp color change is used. This is the situation for the two titrations in this graph. With a maximum increment of 0.1 milliliters for a blue titration curve, which is then in the end more or less a monotonic titration, the potential jump is well reached and thanks to a proper selection of the minimum volume increment, the number of measuring points in the potential jump is good. For a red titration curve, a maximum increment of 0.5 milliliters was used. Since there is no significant signal change for a long time, the maximum volume is added, unfortunately, also just before the potential jump is reached. Therefore, the addition of the next 0.5 milliliters is definitely too large and the signal drops immediately, allowing no proper evalu evaluation anymore. Due to this sudden signal drop, the consecutive added volumes are very small but unfortunately now this is too late. Last but not least, there is the parameter measuring point density. This is a parameter that defines the number of measuring points that are recorded. On the first view, it might be confusing, but the smaller the chosen value is, the more measuring points are taken. This may help for situations where a better resolution is required, for example, to evaluate weak equivalence points. This is shown by the saturation of citric acid with two different values for the measuring point density. There is a reasonable difference in the number of measuring points. You can see the difference of 84 to 73 measuring points. And in addition, the saturation also then takes longer. You can also see that the evaluation of the first and third equivalence point of the citric acid is not influenced by this. But the lower value for the measuring point density provides a better resolution in the area of the second equivalent point, which allows a better evaluation. However, it has to be considered that the ERC is not really sharp, so the reproducibility may not be as good as for the first and third equivalence point, but at least you could, you could evaluate it. So, you have heard a lot about the different titration parameters, but how do you know that you have chosen the best parameters for your application? You can check this by looking into the measuring point list and compare it with your parameters that you have defined in the titration method. In short, the titration should only be controlled through the signal drift criteria. Whenever the maximum limit value for waiting time or volume increment is reached, then the signal drift criteria has been overruled and the electrode response may not correspond to the chemical reaction in the titration vessel. You can check this by looking at the time between the two volumes addition and the volume increment that has been added. If the limit values are never reached, then the titration parameters are well chosen in this case, we speak of a fully drift controlled titration. Are there any other tools to check whether the application is done correctly? And of course, is there any possibility to validate the titration instrument? Instrument validation means to evaluate the correct functioning of the dosing bullet, the measuring interface, and of course, the evaluation algorithm, and is usually done by a titration of a primary standard. These are recommended chemicals that fulfill the following requirements. 
A primary standard has to be stable and available with high purity. They have a low hygroscopicity, what simplifies handling. And they have a high equivalent weight, means you do not have to weigh small amounts, which reduces the weighing error. The most common examples for such standards are if HCL is used as titron, tris hydroxymethyl methane, better known as TRIS, and for sodium hydroxide, potassium hydrogen phthalate is used. If non aqs KOH, for example, is used, then benzoic acid should be used. And for silver nitrates as titron, sodium chloride. Whatever primary standard is used, the validation procedure includes a titration of different sample sizes so that the titrant volumes at the equivalent points are within 10 to 90 percent of the current volume. The recovery for each sample size is calculated and overall the correctness and especially the reproducibility of the different sample sizes is then calculated and should be below 0.3 percent. For the validation of the designated application, the same procedure may be applied. Several, di several different sample sizes are titrated and the recovery of the sample is calculated. Important is also to check the linearity of the result, means the volumes at the equivalent points for different sample sizes should be on a straight line with a good regression factor and, also important, the extrapolation to zero sample should exactly cross the zero points of both axes. If this is not the case, then either the stoichiometry of the chemical reaction is not the same for all sample sizes, or the sample matrix or the solvent shows a blank value, which then would have to be considered for each titration. At this point, I have already reached the end of this presentation about the basics of titration. Let me summarize the most important aspects again. First of all, titration is an absolute method. No instrument calibration is required. The titration hardware has to be selected according to the application. If the wrong equipment is chosen, this may lead to unnecessary, time-consuming, and expensive troubleshooting. The choice of the indication method depends on the required precision and instrument handling. However, nowadays, potentiometric indication can cover nearly all kinds of applications. The titration parameters usually allow an optimization in titration in terms of total analysis time and reagent consumption. So choosing them wisely can save a lot of time and money. So in short, titration still is a very modern, easy to use, fast, and definitely absolutely precise analytical method. I thank you very much for your attention. Following on this presentation, you are welcome to share your feedback or answer questions. However, please understand that we cannot handle individual saturation issues here in this discussion session, but you're more than invited to write your issue and we definitely will follow up later on. So, Thanks again, and maybe see you next time for our webinar, Troubleshooting in Taxation.